three really great reactor systems companies up here. Policy, I would imagine, is the biggest bottleneck for any of these systems, not the actual technology. So what policy or policies do you see that need to be modified uh, most critically? Yeah, from my point of view, I've been in this for 15 years. Uh, there's a lack of knowledge in the general society. Uh, most politicians and journalists has got the whole thing wrong with nuclear energy. So there's there's education that needs to happen. Um, the the second thing is that we have to be reasonable uh, and look at what a number of different technologies. How many people do they kill? How risky are they? And sort of get a level playing field. Uh, all you guys know this that nuclear is sort of a, uh, it has to go through. Uh, <laughs> all kinds of different um, loopholes uh, which other technologies are not required to do and that's unfair and I think if we were making a more fair playing field we don't want to kill anyone but we want to make it in a way where we can make nuclear energy at a reasonable cost and especially a reasonable timeline. I have the great fortune of talking to many of the uh, European regulators about where we can start the first red even inside a regulatory group uh, there, first of all, there's a lack of knowledge about molten reactors and especially thorium. They have many wrong beliefs about how it works. But secondly, they they disagree with each other internally. So it will be quite some time before they know which type of reactors they can approve and to what standards and what rules. So there, it, we're definitely behind on that. There's more and more pressure from, from society and from people who deal with energy policies that we need to find a solution. And at some point in the future, let's say five years from now, there's going to be a, a ketchup moment where, where everything just has to happen very fast. And uh, um, I, I feel we're getting closer and closer to that point of, in time. Uh, in, in particular for Copenhagen Atomics, uh, we have made a unique reactor design that means that we can make the lowest cost energy anywhere in the world whether it's black or green or purple or whatever, we can beat all of them on price. And price is king, as you know. So eventually, when you have the cheapest energy technology, there will be customers lining up. So we don't worry too much about politicians and journalists at this point in time. So before I say what I think really needs to be done in the policy realm, I do want to give a shout out to um, recent policies coming out of the executive branch and Congress, because we've seen almost an historic level of funding and legislation to help support nuclear now. And we're seeing that um, in, in multiple ways, significant amounts of appropriations and policies starting to attempt to level the playing field for nuclear and value nuclear technology and its applications. But what needs to be done, I think, by far, above and beyond anything else, is the elephant in the room. We need an effective, intuitively understandable plan to deal with the so-called nuclear waste by shifting our paradigm that is not scientifically based. This is not waste. This is an incredible resource that is ready and ready to be mined for saving people's lives and cancer to space-based exploration. So this is a first great question and great answers. I don't disagree with anything that's been said. I, I often think about uh, there's two types of laws. There's a, the laws of physics, which uh, aren't going to change tomorrow, and the laws of man, which uh, can change with a stroke <laughs> of a pen. And so that what, what can we change as policy-wise to make this go forward faster? I, that's a great question. Um, so far, the real roadblock in this country to a new nuclear is the NRC. And so that has been sort of the dry hole, if you will, if you want to use a, a oil and gas analogy here of, of why is, why do we not have more people investing or more people in concern about well if you can't get a license then there's no point in trying to do anything and so that's been our focus can we do something that demonstrates the nrc can license it i also agree with ed i think the nrc's come a long way when I stepped out this morning, it was to have a call with the NRC because they are working very closely with us as we're moving forward with licensure. And so 
optimistic about the future, trying to be realistic of where we are at. And I think the challenge for the NRC and, and licensure moving forward is if we do what Tom said and we want to go to small modular reactors, instead of having you know 90 reactors around the country that the NRC needs to license, we want them to license a new reactor every day. And so that challenge of how the NRC can handle that is something I think that's really something we need to be thinking about. Yeah, very good. Um, I, I said earlier, I don't know if you guys, absolutely. I, I said earlier, I said the NRC is just doing what the policymakers tell them to do. So getting mad at the regulator, they're just, they're following an instruction sheet. So if, if we we can change, we can all work to change the, the rules and the policies and make you know things expedited. So absolutely, I, I never blame the, the regulator themselves. I blame whoever sets policy. So my my second uh, question for you guys, and maybe really you know, keep it tight, uh, is, is there any particular supply chain bottleneck that is just uh, you know eating away at you right now? I don't know if Halu, you you know, the, with the war situation and stuff like that, a lot of the small reactor operators are ripping their eyelids off trying to trying to deal with that. So is there a supply chain bottleneck or not? Obviously, we need to stand up. If we're going to move forward to industry and develop a reactor every day, we need to develop the supply chain. And that's everything from uh, uh, moderators to pumps to uh, uh, sills, instrumentation, fuel, all, all of the above. Uh, do we have anything right now that today is keeping us from moving forward? Uh, no, I think we're moving forward. Does it need improvement and stimulation across the board for all of the above? Yes. And I agree with Rusty. Going with the small modular system was not just, I mean, we did it intentionally in part is because of the supply chain. We want to have as many components made here in the United States for many reasons, security of supply, price, and for our country. We owe it to our country. So um, our system, we've already done an initial uh, supply chain analysis, and we feel very confident that we can source the vast majority of the components um, right here in the United States. Uh, our primary concern is to get access to what you have, transuranics. So I would very much like to buy some of that. Uh, so what's the price of uh, one ton of transuranics? <laughs> what, what, what type of transuranic? Which one? Uh, we can run on almost anything. And I, I know your process. Uh, I'm pretty familiar with that. So uh, I think what you get out in the last step, super dirty, all the isotopes above uranium, we can take that even if we have some fishing products in it, no problem. What about like a million dollar per ton? Is that an okay price? <laughs> we'll negotiate later, however. <laughs> we will produce about 40 metric tons optimized transuranic based fuel a year. Cool. So that is gonna be more than what you'll need, I believe. Uh, need for Maybe one even more? Every day. <laughs> so we'll have 40 metric tons and that's just in the US. And um, to give you an example though of supply chain and the reverse on this or supply chain is um, we had uh, a cutting edge advanced battery company come to us and say, we got a problem. Why? Well, our market pathway, we're going to need large volumes of isotopes. And, and in fact, the market right now for Curies is X price. We will even pay a higher price. And we're looking for hundreds of thousands of Curies a year in a particular isotope. We did the math with our engineering team. Oh, that should be okay because we're gonna have about 150 million Curies a year. So this is gonna be a high, high capacity um, facility. But I hope we get to the day where we don't even have enough to supply you. Then we'll build another facility. I have one more point to make. You mentioned also pumps. I went to the uh, um, Moldsall Reactor Workshop in Oak Ridge a couple of days ago, and there was all the pump suppliers around the world were so there, and Copenhagen Atomic is also one of them, and we had discussions about when are these pumps going to be ready for Moldsall Reactors, sort of uh, commercial scale Moldsall Reactors. And uh, of course, it depends on the regulator. How many years do they want to test the pump before you can put it in the uh, in a commercial reactor and run it for say five or ten years? If you only need to test it for three months, no problem. But if the regulator requires you to test it for five years before you can put it in, in a in a commercial reactor, then we have a problem. Uh, and it's not known yet. And uh, there are 
I don't believe that there's any uh, pump company right now who could supply a commercial pump. Uh, so we, we're not there yet. It's definitely something where we need to develop the technologies. What question do you wish people would ask you? My question is, why do you do this? What's the point of it? You know, are you trying to get rich? You're trying to save them? Because of this. <laughs> Well, I think the question for me would, well, that I would like to see is, how is what you're doing, how w would this help society? How is it useful? What's the whole point? I hear you isotopes for novel targeted alpha therapy fighting cancer. Um, is it space-based or exploration? What's your value proposition? Why is it why is it so important that it is going to be good for society? That opens up the door for us to explain our business. I mean, you should always know why you're doing what you're doing. And if what if, if why you're doing it is to make money, that, that nothing wrong with that. But if you can bless the world while you're doing it, that's even a better answer. And I think that uh, you know, advanced, safe power, medical isotopes, uh, pure water, those are things that the world needs more of and uh, they need it soon. And so that's why we're doing what we're doing. Yes, indeed. Just a quick comment, may I suggest? There's a great slogan I've heard. It's only waste if we waste it. <laughs> I like that. I'm Bill DiRio from Boulder, Colorado. And I'm, um, it turns out I'm running for the State House of Representatives in Colorado. And I'm wondering if you gentlemen could give me some ideas about what things states can do to assist this. We know we have a federal uh, ice jam, but is there things that the individual states can do that can increase the skins? So uh, I think the, the short answer is yes. If you look across the, the, the country, lots of states are competing for this, right? I think you mentioned this morning, uh, governors saying, we want this for our state. We've seen that over and over again. So I, I think there are things. I mean, obviously at the end of the day, you want community buy into whatever you're doing. You want the support of the community around you. And so, you know, there's states that are a little bit more um, friendly than others. And so I, I think there are certainly things that states can do. We, we um, um, we got a resolution from the state of Texas, both the House and Senate, saying they support this research and deployment. Um, and so that was a big boost when people ask, you know, are, are you doing things? Are there people protesting outside? No, we have support uh, local. The city of Abilene is supporting this uh, statewide state resolution supporting this. And so I, I think it's very important if you want it, more of it in your state or your city, then those local communities need to be supporting what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say simply uh, states should ensure their laws are set up in a way that supports and all of the above, including nuclear, and that in includes a sustainable approach, including dealing with the back end and recycling. That's very important. And a lot of states still have moratoriums on nuclear, and even those who don't, um, they, they really have not um, set the laws up to support a level playing field for nuclear to realize its full potential in their states. Yeah, I think that the states should invite uh, all the developers and companies like yours uh, to come and pitch. Basically, just invite them to the state and ask them to pitch what they could do for that state and have a dialogue about well, how can we solve those issues. Uh, there's been no dialogue in the last uh, 10 years, but very little there has been some. Uh, the, the issue is flooring. What if somebody you can pitch on flooring and someone came up with a smear and said, yeah, but what about that waste? Yeah, so for thorium molten salt reactors, uh, the waste there, if you build a molten salt reactor in the right way, especially a thorium molten salt reactor, you can actually uh, continue to burn. What we've developed is a breeder reactor. So you continue to add thorium and you burn that, and what comes out on the other end is fission products. And yes, that is waste, but some of it can be used for other applications, uh, and some of it will need to be stored for 300 years. Uh, but when we look at other forms of energy, I think that waste stream is a very a uh, generous one and a, uh, not a big problem at all um, to have the fission product come out of your reactor. Um, remember that you uh, you only get one gram per megawatt day of energy, so it's not a, a lot.
we have a problem as a nation what we do with our current spent nuclear waste and i think kira has got that handled uh, what we're working on is let's work on designs that produce less to start with why why just use three or five percent of the fuel and throw away the 95 percent so if you put your fuel as a liquid state inside of a molten salt reactor then you can burn that 95 plus percent to start with and not not produce the waste that, that we found ourselves in so let's start with reactors that produce less waste for a beginning point and and let me just say for our new site process while we're it's capable and intentionally set up to recycle virtually all types of used nuclear fuel it is particularly optimized in our our technical sort of um, um, evaluations and assessment for thorium based molten salt reactors particularly well optimized and we could easily handle the fission products and mine those and turn those into products for society the plutonium and uranium waste do not have that problem. Uh, the plutonium is a very valuable thing if you want to make a breeder reactor. You cannot make a breeder reactor with uranium in thermal spectrum. It's impossible. So if you want to make a breeder reactor in thermal spectrum, then you need plutonium and thorium. So it, it's it's a perfect byproduct. I mean, you, it's it's worth more than coal and diamonds. You, so it's not it's not a problem at all. It's the it's the key value. Uh, and then you say, okay, after many years when you run a thorium reactor, is there going to be plutonium in there? No, there's not. It's going to be burned all of it. But there is there is a few of the higher actinides, like small percentages. I will, I'll show some charts later in my talk later today about how that turns out. And under President Bush with Global Nuclear Energy Partnership, one of the key elements of their plan was um, a burner reactor, a breed and burn. Um, you're breeding plutonium but you're burning it before it ever comes out. That, from a security perspective, is very important. As opposed to a pure breeder reactor, I don't think anybody's talking about that. It's a breed and then burn in the same process. When I talk to people about small nuclear reactors at home, uh, people say, what about the Russians bombing nuclear plants in uh, Ukraine? What's gonna happen to other people in our community? Whether you bomb a gas uh, storage facility or nuclear reactor, it's not going to look nice afterwards, but I do think that it's better to bomb a molten reactor than to bomb a light water reactor. Light water reactor has very high pressure and steam that would escape right away into the atmosphere. A molten reactor, you would have salt spill all over the, your, your property, like on the floor, and you would have to go and clean that up at some point in time, but I don't think anyone but body would die from that. I find that highly unlikely that anyone would buy die if you throw a bomb on top of a molten salt reactor. Thank the three panelists and. Uh